Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, Ricardo Lopes, as always, and today I'm joined by Dr. Ian Tetersol. He is currently Curator Emeritus in the Division of Anthropology of the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. He has carried out both primatological and paleontological fieldwork in countries as diverse as Madagascar, Vietnam, Suriname, Yemen, and Mauritius, trained in archaeology and anthropology at the University of Cambridge and in geology and vertebrate paleontology at Yale University, Dr. Tattersall has concentrated his research in, since the 60s in three main areas, the analysis of the human fossil record and its integration with evolutionary theory, the origin of human cognition, and the, st and the study of the ecology and systematics of the lemurs of Madagascar. He is also a prominent interpreter of human paleontology to the public, with numerous trade books to his credit, as well as several articles in Scientific American and the co-editorship of the Definitive Encyclopedia of Human Evolution and Prehistory. So, Dr. Tetersol, it's a great pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you a lot for taking the time to come on. Not at all. Very pleased to be here. Okay, great. So, uh, as I mentioned in the introduction, uh, you study the human fossil record. So, mm -hmm. uh, do you focus your study mostly on the genus Homo? Well, my studies have been uh, basically on the form of the human fossil record. Mm -hmm. I'm interested in diversity within the human fossil record. And as it turns out, you know, about half of that diversity happens to be at the species level within the uh, genus Homo. So I guess I have concentrated a lot on, um, on the genus Homo. But it's also true that I've worked a lot, as you said in your introduction very kindly, on the lemurs of Madagascar. And that is a very, very diverse group. And um, I'm very happy to have had that exposure to the lemurs because I think it brings something valuable into uh, my perspective on the human fossil record. Mm -hmm. So, when we talk about the human fossil record, how far back does it go? Because since it includes, uh, as I understand, species before the ones that came with the uh, genus Homo, like Homo erectus, so uh, how far back does it go then? We generally think of uh, the human fossil record as being the uh, record of uh, Homo sapiens and of all its uh, relatives uh, that are not apes. And if we broadly um, uh, uh, define the human family in that way, we have a record that goes back about seven million years. Mm -hmm. So it's basically the same as the hominins, right? Because there's that distinction between the hominids and the hominins, and so the human fossil record would basically correspond to the hominins. Correct? Yeah, it's really a distinction without a difference because um, I was uh, generally, uh, I, I was educated to think of the larger group to which we belong as being the hominids. And now it's, uh, it's uh, more common to reduce that to the, uh, to, to the subfamily level from the family level to the hominin group, but in fact, it's the same. It's the same grouping of genera. Oh, it's the same grouping because I thought that the hominids also included other great apes like the chimpanzees, the bonobos, the gorillas. At least those three. If you if you believe if you uh, believe that it is valuable to reduce the level of the. Uh, of, of the group to which we belong to the subfamily group, then yes, the family does include um, the, uh, the great apes. But um, I, uh, I, I, I use the terms interchangeably. Um, I, uh, I, 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 I prefer to use the, the, the family hominidae, actually, uh, for uh, humans and their close relatives because they are so diverse. Mm -hmm. It's an incredibly diverse group, and I think it's a group that deserves to be recognized at the level of the family. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. And what kind of um, what what kind of uh, I, I mean I'm missing the word now, but what can we learn by studying the great apes and including them in our family? I mean, because you study the human fossil record, but certainly we can get some sort of evolutionarily relevant information if we include the other great apes, right? Totally. You want to to, to uh because we're human beings, you know, we start with ourselves, right? We are very uh, homocentric in that, in, in that regard. But we learn about the context in which we exist best by studying our closest relatives, the uh, great apes. And whether we unite ourselves with the great apes at the level of the super family or just of the family really makes no difference to this. Mm -hmm. It's a taxonomic argument that... Um, uh, is more an argument based on technicalities than it is um, realities on the ground. Mm -hmm. And do we know anything about our last common ancestor? I mean, the one that then diverged uh, and one of the branches became us and the other one went to chimpanzees and bonobos, I think. Do we know anything about it? Or at least do we have any assumptions about uh, its sociality, behavior, its anatomy, and things like that? We can certainly uh, make, uh, make some assumptions. Um, and in general, it does look as if our group has changed more since the time of the Cavan ancestor with the uh, bonobos and chimpanzees than they have. But it doesn't mean that that ancestor was closely like uh, bonobos or chimpanzees. And remarkably enough, in many of their social characteristics, uh, bonobos and chimpanzees are very different creatures uh, indeed. And um, our, uh, our peculiarities, of course, mainly uh, stem uh, on the physical level from our having adopted, our ancestors having adopted an upright bipedal way of moving around on the ground. And that seems to have gone right back to the very beginning of our family at about uh, uh, seven million years ago. It's bipedality that seems to have been the founding adaptation of the hominids and everything else followed from that. And most of our physical peculiarities are directly related to our unusual way of locomoting. Mm -hmm. But let's try now to focus a little bit more on the species from the genus Homo, because that's okay. the main reason why I invited you on the show. I've already spoken about other species with other paleoanthropologists on the show. And uh, I mean, it, is it correct that it was during the Pleistocene epoch that these species of the genus Homo evolved, right? Uh, broadly speaking, that is correct. There is a bit of argument right now against about uh, how long the Pleistocene was, about when the Pleistocene began. Um, I was always brought up to believe that uh, the Pleistocene began at around 1.8 million years ago. Um, and it has since uh, uh, been redefined to go further back in time to about two and a half a million years ago, and not everybody is happy with that. Uh, if we use the short Pleistocene, that pretty much coincides with the um, with the emergence of what I would recognize as the uh, genus Homo. Uh, there are in the interim period between about 1.8 and 2.5 million years ago, there are uh, some mainly fragmentary fossils that people have regarded as holy homo, but that I don't really think fall under a meaningful definition of something that belongs in our own genus, which is, of course, defined by our own species. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, at, at least last time I looked up, uh, the Pleistocene was located or... or 
people were saying that the Pleistocene ran from around 2.5 million years ago to uh, 11,700 years ago or something like that. I mean, until the beginning of the Holocene, that is the current epoch and the, the epoch where humans developed agriculture and those kinds of things. So, I mean, the... That is a new uh, definition. That's mm -hmm. a new definition of... Uh, of uh, the Pleistocene that um, uh, we all have to accept. And if we do accept it, uh, then uh, the genus Homo evolved, in my view, well within the Pleistocene. Mm -hmm. And yeah. at about the time when we used to think that the Pleistocene began. Mm -hmm. And the first species of the genus Homo is the Homo erectus, right? Or can we go back even to Homo habilis? I mean, I, I have already spoken with some paleoanthropologists and Homo habilis is a complicated species to classify. As far as I understand, there are some people that include it in the genus Homo and other people that do not do that, correct? That's correct. Um, we have this, 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 this form called Homo habilis, which is consists of a very miscellaneous uh, grouping of, uh, of uh, fossils, most of which really do not sit into a neat definition of our genus Homo. You know, uh, our genus Homo is defined by Homo sapiens, and any member of the genus Homo really has to have something that ties it specifically in with Homo sapiens in order to be uh, regarded as a member of our genus. And we begin to find things like that at about, uh, about uh, 1.8 million years ago in Africa. And the earliest uh, really good species that we could uh, recognize that fulfilled all the requirements, I think, to belong to genus Homo is a form called Homo ergaster. Mm -hmm. And that is sometimes known as um, African Homo erectus because it is an inherited belief that Homo erectus from um, Java, which was discovered and described back in the 1890s, was the sort of the middle stage of a gradual sequence of human evolution. Now we know that uh, human evolution was not a single straight line gradually modifying over time at all, but rather it was a process of experimentation and of throwing out new species, um, doing things their own way in the environment. And um, uh, African Homo erectus to me means nothing because there's nothing in Africa that actually looks like the type specimen from uh, Java that was described back in the in the 19th century. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, and our evolution is like the branches of a tree or even sometimes uh, a, a web because uh, er, before er, uh, in the history of anthropology, let's say, people had that linear view that uh, there was one species that went extinct and then gave rise to another species and so on and so forth. And so yeah. there was only one human species on the planet in a single moment and then another one and so on and so forth. But nowadays we have we know that different species coexisted and even some of them interacted with one another during our evolutionary history, right? That's absolutely right. Yes, uh, there is a diversity of uh, species within the genus Homo. The uh, uh, idea uh, came in uh, in 1950 uh, that um, uh, human evolution was simply a process of gradual transformation where species, with, uh, species only becoming extinct by virtue of transforming into something else. Mm -hmm. And so you had this long continuity uh, process of refinement um, over, over time. And now we, we know it wasn't like that. Mm -hmm. 
exactly. So, uh, and another question would be then, since we're talking about the genus Homo, and mm -hmm. there's this complicated question about what was exactly the first species that belonged to this genus, mm -hmm. is there a basic set of traits or a basic set of criteria that we use to define the genus Homo? The uh, actual um, definition, of course, has to be a definition of, of descent. And um, there is no, there is no um, uh, absolute criteria for what, how broadly a genus uh, can diversify and still remain one genus. Um, that is a bit arbitrary, but basically, uh, it's generally accepted now that a member of the genus Homo needs to have basically be closely related to, uh, to, to Homo sapiens and uh, its immediate group of relatives and to have a basic bodily structure that is, um, that, that is characteristic of uh, Homo sapiens today. And we find that going back to about 1.8 million years ago in Africa in the form of this, uh, this, this uh, species Homo ergaster, which had a small brain, an eight, 800, uh, um, 800 uh, uh, cubic center uh, brain, uh, sort of a cubic centimeter brain, um, but did have a body structure that was basically like ours, not exactly like ours, but basically the same. And that's where we find uh, the, the, the first creatures that really would have looked on the landscape um, uh, to be rather similar to Homo sapiens. Mm -hmm. There was nothing before that that would have looked on the landscape to be, uh, uh, to be really in the same ballpark. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, earlier in the interview, I asked you about the Pleistocene because since, uh, okay, so let's assume now that the genus Homo or the species that are part of the, of the genus Homo evolved during the Pleistocene. Uh, wasn't this an epoch that was characterized by a lot of climate change and environmental fluctuations? I'm asking you this because this might be relevant to understand and why when we got to Homo sapiens, we evolved such high levels of intelligence and we evolved culture and art and language and we started using fire and things yeah. like that. Correct. Well, I think the first, uh, the first thing is to understand that the Pleistocene was a time of very unstable environments. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you are certainly not looking at a lineage that is perfecting its adaptation to a particular environment. Um, basically, what the Pleistocene did was to provide multiple opportunities to experiment with the basic uh, uh, potential that there was in being a hominid. You had uh, very short-term changes, very large changes in them, um, in, uh, in, 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 in environmental circumstances in very short periods of time. This would have divided populations apart from each other. It would have thrown um, uh, divided populations together again. It would have changed the conditions under which the uh, particular populations were existing. And this is exactly the conditions in which you predict that you would get a lot of uh, evolutionary diversification, which is apparently what happened. Mm -hmm. Yes, and we can also add to that the fact that there were migrations even out of Africa, migrations, and so mm -hmm. we had different species in different locations at the same yeah. time, and some of them interbred. And so uh, Homo sapiens, the current species that we are worldwide right now, that seems to be the only uh, hominin or, or or human species that exists yep. at the moment, at mm -hmm. least, is yep. we could say is basically a mosaic of different species that interbred in different places. Uh, 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 I, I wouldn't put it that strongly. You know, okay. I think there is in the early in the early stages of the, of the differentiation of new lineages. Okay, uh, there is a uh, um, you know, is a potential. 
for interbreeding. But by the time that a new lineage is really established, um, that is not really going to make much difference. It's like uh, the, the best uh, documented case we have, of course, is with the, uh, the uh, Neanderthals, with whom we share an ancestor, I don't know, 500, 700,000 years um, ago. And there does seem to be some uh, genetic, uh, genomic reasons for uh, believing that there was some genetic interchange between uh, humans and um, and uh, Neanderthals when they first came into contact. But that didn't really have a long-term effect on the evolutionary fate of either group. Mm -hmm. Homo sapiens went on to become whatever we are today, maybe with the odd um, uh, you know, Neanderthal gene allowing it to, to go to high altitudes or something uh, like that. Um, and the Neanderthals went on to become extinct pretty much the way that they were. Um, there wasn't, we don't see a, a, a notable change in the, um, in the, uh, uh, in the uh, Neanderthal record prior to their extinction. So basically they were, they were differentiated, um, but hanky-panky will occur. And so there was undoubtedly a little bit of a genetic interchange but it wasn't much. Mm -hmm. And the uh, gen genomic indications are that it was uh, relatively little. And uh, in fact, there are people who argue that you don't even need to, uh, to have interbreeding between Neanderthals and modern humans to get what is regarded to be the Neanderthal genetic signal, genomic signal, um, in, the modern, in the modern genome. That in fact, this could be an echo from an earlier common ancestor. Mm -hmm. um, but I have no problem with the notion that there were, was some minor interbreeding with, uh, between Neanderthals and modern humans. Uh, it's just that it did not make a really significant difference to the future evolutionary history of either group. Mm -hmm. Okay. And does the evidence that we have nowadays points toward us having had as Homo sapiens one single origin in Africa? or multiple different origins? I don't think a single species can have a multiple origin. The only biological um, uh, mm -hmm. model that we have for the origin of species uh, links the origin to a particular time and a particular place and a particular population. And that is how new species come into uh, existence as variants of pre-existing species. Right, and those variants uh, acquire their peculiarities in a particular part of a species range. <laughs> then, if somehow the new variant uh, becomes separated from the old species, from the body of the species, um, uh, it's possible for speciation uh, to occur, for, to uh, acquire incompatibilities. Uh, genomic incompatibilities between the, uh, the, 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 the new species and the uh, parental one. And that's how species occur. And that's always tied to a time and a place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So just to take a step back now, when we mentioned the Pleistocene, uh, it was an epoch that was characterized by lots of environmental fluctuation, as we mentioned. Mm -hmm. So uh, isn't it the case that one of the traits that we've acquired and other species also have it, but to a lesser extent, uh, that play the be a big role in our evolution was culture and the way by which we can accumulate uh, knowledge over time. I mean, knowledge not only in terms of material things, but mm -hmm. also intellectual, let's say, knowledge that it gave us a, a, a big advantage in that sort of uh, epoch. Absolutely. Uh, humans are utterly dependent on culture. Mm -hmm. We're not the only creatures that have culture in the sense uh, that we pass learned behaviors down from one generation to the next uh, through a process of learning. Um, other creatures do that. But we are so dependent now on the behaviors that we learn. 
I was, uh, remember, I was once on a, on a panel uh, and the question of, um, of trying to genetically engineer a Neanderthal came up, you know. And the first thing that, that, that occurred to me was, you know, if we had an infant Neanderthal, how would we teach it to be a Neanderthal? How would we know how to bring it up as, as a Neanderthal? You can bet that a Neanderthal, genetically engineered Neanderthal child, um, uh, brought up with uh, modern human uh, uh, cultural cues would not behave like Neanderthals used to behave. We are so much what we learn to be. Uh, the culture is, is so deeply part of who we are, it really is who we are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, there are other species that have culture. We know that chimpanzees, bonobos, and other great apes have culture, and even species that go far behind in our evolutionary history, the, uh, ev even, I, I mean, not only primates, but also other mammals and species like that uh, have some sort, at least, of rudimentary culture. So mm -hmm. I think that what we can say characterizes us, or at least the genus Homo, is the fact that we have a cumulative cultural evolution. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I would, I would uh, generally agree with that. I would all also have to say though that you know because culture is is something that influences behavior you know but culture expresses itself through uh, behavior uh, behavior of all kinds communication uh, whatever uh, and um, because culture is is strictly uh, behavioral um, the way in which you process information in your brain is really key um, and I think that homo sapiens processes information in a unique way. So that when we talk about culture in the genus Homo, we've got to be very careful not to make it too much about ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, I think that we are, we, we are intellectually different from any other hominid uh, or any other um, uh, member of the genus Homo that ever existed. And that that is a really significant difference which would impact on how culture expressed itself in us and in them. Mm -hmm. And do we know when exactly in our revolutionary history we started to have cumulative culture? I mean, did it start with uh, the first species that is consensually part of the genus Homo, Homo erectus in this case, or when exactly? Uh, the first real evidence that we have of what you could call culture would be, would come with the invention of stone tools, mm -hmm. um, which, you know, in, in, in a broad sense goes back, you know, in a narrow sense goes back to about two and a half million years ago and may go back a little bit further than that. But whenever the making of stone tools came in, it was before the genus Homo came along. Uh, the first stone tools were almost certainly made by creatures that we would now call Australopithecines or Australopiths, who were members of the group from which Homo emerged ultimately. But they already had uh, a tradition of tool making before uh, Homo uh, came along. But what is interesting is that the arrival of the genus Homo does not seem to have been itself associated with any innovations in stone tool making. And it certainly doesn't appear to have been associated with any difference in the pattern of cultural innovation as we see reflected in the stone tools. Um, it was a million years after the invention of the first stone tool before a really radical change in concept for making a stone tool came along. And then it was another million years before the next radical um, innovation in stone tool making came along. So that the technological pattern seems to have been that 
uh, a, a radically new way of, well, in this case, making tools uh, came along and then nothing much happened for a long time. And then a new way of doing things came in, uh, sometimes with the old way of doing things persisting alongside it. Uh, but today we're used to a, a pattern of change which is continuous. You know, within our lifetimes, you know, we have uh, replaced the technologies that we use in all kind of uh, aspects of our lives several times. That is typical Homo sapiens, but it's not typical of anything else that existed before Homo sapiens. Mm -hmm. And did those revolutions in stone making or stone tool making uh, coincide in any way with the increases that we now know uh, occurred in our brain volume or not? No, apparently not. This is a very interesting thing. Um, brain volumes in, in the hominids, uh, well, in the genus Homo, in the genus Homo, brain volumes uh, from about 1.8 million years ago began to expand. Mm -hmm. We already have brains a bit larger than the Australopithecus 1.8 million years ago. And then on average, human brain size has doubled in a million years. Mm -hmm. um, and this is, uh, this is something quite extraordinary. Um, but what we do not know is what the pattern of that brain size increase was. We know that hominid brain sizes, homo brain sizes, tended to increase quite remarkably and consistently over this time. But we don't know how many species were involved. We don't know what the time ranges of those species were. And so the, the pattern of brain increase is, um, is hard to talk about. But we do know that brains tended to get larger in at least three lineages, three separate lineages of uh, the genus homo. They got larger in the uh, lineage leading to the Neanderthals, Homo neanderthalensis lineage. Uh, they got larger in the Homo erectus lineage in Java and in, uh, in, uh, in Eastern Asia. And they got uh, bigger in Africa in the, uh, in the lineage leading to ourselves. And so there was something about, about how Homo species as a whole interacted with the world that predisposed them to larger brains. And we don't know what that was. What we do know is that it is not something that is specific to Homo sapiens. Mm -hmm. And what we know more when we're talking about uh, brain size is that once Homo sapiens started to manipulate information in the unusual way, the symbolic way in which it does today, brains got smaller again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think that, you know, I mean, our, an Ice Age Homo sapiens brain uh, was about the same size as a Neanderthal brain, pretty big. And since, since the uh, Pleistocene, we have lost something like uh, 13%. Or, or, of, of our brain volume on average. And I think that is simply because the increase in brain size that we see in these three lineages, the uh, Neanderthal lineage, the Homo sapiens lineage, the Homo erectus lineage, probably has something to do with the fact that whatever it is that we can call intelligence, scaled with overall brain size, that there was a, if you want, a, a brute force algorithm mm -hmm. driving the way that, um, uh, that the brain uh, manipulated information and um, therefore depended on the size uh, of the brain. To, to get smarter, you had to get a bigger brain. But once the brain started working on this new algorithm, on this new symbolic algorithm, that algorithm was more frugal in energetic terms, didn't require as much brain, uh, raw brain tissue. Brains of, as you know, a very, very energy hungry or, um, organ that you don't want to have any more of than you absolutely need. And the brains became smaller again.
Mm-hmm. That's my yeah. take on it. Yeah, just as a short comment, I guess that uh, brain power depends not only on its volume, but also on the way it's organized. Sometimes just the, a different organization uh, gives a, a given species higher intelligence. It doesn't need to be just number the raw number of neurons, correct? That's absolutely right. That's absolutely right. And it's, it's all to do, in our case, with the ability to physically to make associations uh, between uh, the inputs and outputs of different parts of the brain. Mm-hmm. So we will come back to symbolism later on in the interview, but let me ask you, when you mentioned the revolutions that occurred during the Paleolithic, um, the last one or the would be what people call the cognitive revolution that occurred some 50,000 to 100,000 years ago when uh, basically artifacts exploded in diversity. I mean, different stone tools, uh, things related to religion, to the arts, uh, cave wall paintings and all of that sort of thing. Yeah. The, 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 Archaeological record of the last 100,000 years is completely qualitatively different from anything that preceded it. But it all emerged from the African Middle uh, Stone Age uh, tradition. And the African Middle Stone Age uh, tradition, when it began, was very, very different from the the, uh, Middle Stone Age tradition when it ended. There was a lot of symbolic uh, behavior at uh, at the end. Of, of, of the Middle Stone Age, and much, much less at, at, the, at the beginning. So we know really where the transition occurred. And as soon as, um, as hominids, uh, as, as humans, you know, Homo sapiens left Africa, and now we have the, the genomic record uh, that can help us in documenting how and when that occurred, um, as soon as humans, um, uh, with symbolic capacities, left Africa, they took over the world and basically eliminated all of the other hominid competition in a very, very short time. Homo erectus disappeared in, uh, in, 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 in Java and China. Uh, you know, Homo floresiensis disappeared in, uh, in, in Flores. Uh, the uh, um, Neanderthals disappeared in, in, uh, in Europe. And of course, there's no competition left in Africa either. So once we have this symbolic capacity, um, we take over the world, we become an, an, uh, basically a, a form of competition that no other hominid was able to deal with. Mm-hmm. So we've already mentioned some of the environmental aspects that we had to deal with during our evolutionary history, particularly Mm -hmm. the fact that the Pleistocene was characterized by environmental fluctuations. But Mm -hmm. uh, what other uh, selective pressures were were we put under that led to the development of our modern brains? Because there are people that refer to our complex sociality, other people that refer to culture, other people that refer to the fact that we started cooking meat and other types of food and that allowed us to extract more nutrients and grow bigger brains. Other other people also mention the fact that we have extended uh, p- uh, childhoods and so, uh, mm-hmm. I, I mean, people have to uh, cooperate in breeding children and mm-hmm. things like that. So do you think that it's all of these factors together that led to the development or the evolution of our species as we are today? or? Yeah, all of these, uh, all of these uh, different um, aspects enter into the picture, but I do not think any of them was a driver of uh, human beings becoming who we became. Um, I think natural selection is, uh, is, is a bit of an issue here. Um, my own personal opinion is that natural selection is much more of a stabilizing uh, factor in populations, trimming off all ends both ends of the distribution to keep populations fit. 
it's very much more difficult to imagine it as a slow driver of uh, populations generation by generation over many, many, many thousands of years or millions of years um, in uh, the very fluctuating environments of the, of the Pleistocene. And um, my, my, my preference would be uh, to, to look for um, random effects, small effects in, uh, in, in, or, or effects happening in small genetically unstable populations of which, of course, there were many during, uh, during the Pleistocene in Africa. Conditions, doubtless, fragmented human populations, brought them together again, and created the conditions in which random effects could really have an important uh, effect on, um, on, uh, on, on innovation, genetic, genomic innovation in hominids. Mm -hmm. And when in our evolutionary history can we talk about modern humans? And what would a modern human be characterized by? Well, uh, you can look upon modern humans in two ways. You could say a modern human is a member of Homo sapiens. Mm -hmm. Homo sapiens is a species we're all aware of. We have a very uh, slenderly built uh, body skeleton. Uh, we have um, um, large brains. We have our, our, uh, our, uh, our faces tucked underneath the bottom of the skull rather than, uh, than projecting out in front of it. We have all of these peculiarities that tell us that we are members of, of this species, Homo sapiens. And the earliest fossils we find that um, fulfill these morphological criteria go back to about 200,000 to about 160,000 years ago in Africa. So we know that our physical species uh, was established in Africa in that time frame, but it wasn't behaving the way that we do. It wasn't making cave art, you know, it wasn't engraving ostrich egg shells. It wasn't doing the crazy things that Homo sapiens does today. And I, my take on it is that the, the potential for us to be symbolic creatures was born when we acquired our peculiar modern anatomy 200,000 years ago, but that its new uses had to be discovered by uh, the invention of some behavioral feature later on. And I think we can look where we can see that that um, the, the, this new form of behavior um, uh, beginning to reveal itself in the uh, archaeological record in Africa at around a hundred thousand years ago, with all this bodily decoration, you know, the shell, uh, shell beads, and then very soon after that. Um, uh, overtly symbolic objects like uh, engraved plaques and engraved ostrich eggshells and so on. So there's a huge behavioral revolution in this period. And uh, we have to think of, well, what could have spurred that revolution? And my guess would be that this is, we are seeing the birth of language. Language maps onto pretty much perfectly maps onto symbolic behavior. What we do in our heads that is absolutely unique um, among all other uh, organisms in the world is to sort of deconstruct the world around us into a vocabulary of abstract symbols in our minds that then we can reorganize according to rules to come up with alternative visions of the world. We can think about the world, we cannot just describe the world as it is using language, but we can actually come up with ideas about how it might be. And I think that language and symbolic thought are so closely mapped onto each other, it's impossible to think of one thing without the other. So imagine 200,000 years ago, you have a population of, uh, of Homo sapiens in some place in Africa, uh, probably a rather small 
population, probably a highly stressed population. And within that population, some kids start to, to, um, to attach meanings to sounds. Clearly, you know, vocal communication is not unique to humans. And vocal communication goes back a long way in, uh, in, in, in human history. Vocalizations were there. But it was necessary to start attaching um, uh, meanings to the individual sounds that could then be manipulated um, to to come up with these new formulations about the world. And that's what language does for us. Mm -hmm. And we've seen languages be spontaneously invented by uh, by kids in uh, in uh, Nicaraguan schools for the deaf. Uh, for, uh, for for example, we know that languages can be uh, can be spontaneously invented, um, just so long as you have the intellectual equipment, you have the physical equipment, the hardware to allow you to do it. And I think that that hardware came along in the human brain as a passive result, and uh, probably a completely you know a, a byproduct. Um, of the uh, the um, reorganization of the uh, of, of of the brain that we see coming with the uh, the modern human cranium, mm -hmm. you know, uh, we have very 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 differently um, uh, constructed uh, uh, crania from uh, any of, of our close relatives, and there was obviously a major. Um, a major developmental reorganization at the time of the birth of Homo sapiens that would have created a brain that was capable of doing these manipulations as soon as somebody thought of some way of using this potential. And I think maybe just kids playing around the place would have, um, would have accidentally discovered this mm -hmm. potential. Mm -hmm. So let me see if I get this correctly. So uh, you are saying then that more than natural selection, the thing that played the biggest role uh, in our evolutionary history for us to arrive at the current species that we are was cultural evolution and more specifically the fact that we were able to develop symbolism as a byproduct of other uh, cognitive yeah. mechanisms that were the result of natural selection. Well, no, I, I, I think uh, they were, they, they, the, the, the conditions all came together and they didn't come together under natural selection. I think it was a, an accidental coming together of all these necessary conditions. Obviously, it couldn't have happened if all of the conditions hadn't been right. So the evolutionary background for all of the different elements that go into our being, able to do what we can uniquely do, um, are, uh, are relevant. And... Uh, we wouldn't be who we are today if anything that has happened in our past has not ha had not happened. But I think the coming together was more or less adventitious. It was not driven into, into existence by uh, natural selection at all. Mm -hmm. And because symbolism is so intimately related to language, do we know exactly when in our evolutionary history language appeared and what was the first homo species that spoke any sort of language? That would have to be homo sapiens. Mm -hmm. And it has obviously to be at some point after uh, the uh, the birth of Homo sapiens as a physical entity, so after 200,000 years. And it's something that we would expect to show you an inflection in the behavioral record. And that's what we find at around 100,000 years ago. In the African Middle Stone Age, you're finding a whole new set of behaviors emerging. And almost immediately after those new behaviors had emerged, and we're talking, you know, just a few tens of thousands of years, not very long time in the uh, greater scheme of things. Uh, as soon as that happened, 
suddenly Homo sapiens is out of Africa and has taken over the whole world, something that no other previous uh, uh, hominid species had ever been able to do, even though hominids had been going out from Africa into, into uh, the, uh, the wider world for a couple of million years already. Mm -hmm. Yes, I asked you that because there are some people like, for example, the linguist Daniel Everett that say mm -hmm. or propose that language first appeared at least in a more rudimentary form with Homo erectus also because Homo erectus already had a complex sociality and so since you are mentioning particularly the behavior that Homo sapiens had, I guess that you are also trying to derive that conclusion from behavioral traits, right? Yeah. Well, the thing is that uh, we, uh, that, that Homo erectus probably was pretty, pretty sophisticated uh, cognitively and probably was uh, uh, culturally uh, uh, pretty sophisticated uh, as well. But that does not mean that Homo erectus had language. I think if Homo erectus had language, uh, it would have uh, done what we do long before we started doing it. It would ruin the world long before we got here. Um, I, I, you know, we like to think that, that, that everything has to build in, on, on something, something that pre-existed. And that's absolutely true. But I think there is something qualitatively different about language and about what, what we do. And there are other linguists like, you know, Bob Berwick and Noam Chomsky and whatnot, that will tell you that actually the, op the, 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 the operation, the mental operation that lies at the base of language, you know, whether you want to call it recursion or whatever it is, is actually a fairly, a fairly um, uh, a simple, a, a simple algorithm and one that could just be adopted in, um, in a short sort of, period of time. If you have the mental equipment, you can do it. Mm -hmm. yes. And you have, the, you have the mental equipment, not, not because it allows you to do that, but just because you happen to, uh, to, to have the right combination of things handed you by history. Mm -hmm. So going back to symbolism, let me just ask you another question about that. Uh, don't you think that perhaps we I mean, surely anthropologists take this into account, particularly archaeologists, but uh, don't we have to be careful when we are dealing with symbolic pieces of uh, whatever, whatever kind of object that we gather in different locations? Because, I mean, we might be attributing a particular kind of meaning or symbolism to it, deriving from our own culture that didn't really correspond to mm -hmm. the function or whatever kind of thing they, uh, the creator was trying to transmit to other people back then tens or hundreds of yeah. thousands of years ago. That, that's one thing that we, all, we always have to take into consideration that, for example, no. when we classify something as a religious piece of art, it, it might not have been religious. It might have been something else, right? For example. Ah, you're, absolutely, you're absolutely right. The, the whole point about symbols is that they are arbitrary. And uh, so that uh, you, cannot, you cannot necessarily infer uh, the meaning of a symbol from its form, right? So it's so just that, that, that whatever culture shares a symbol, also shares agreement on its on its meaning, and once that culture has disappeared, that meaning may be irrecoverable. So yeah, you know, I take I take groups to see uh, the Ice Age caves in, uh, in 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 France and Spain, you know, and everybody always wants wants explanations, and I I say uh, to them all the time, I cannot tell you what the uh, the um, artist or the artisan was trying to was trying to convey. We cannot know what they were trying to convey, but we know that it meant something. Mm -hmm. And you know that this is not random. You know that this is meaningful. 
So we can be sure about that. There is a message embedded in it, and we'll never know what the message is, but it makes it no less symbolic for that. So we can, we can look back and look for signs of symbolism and say, okay, the earliest sign of symbolism we have is the earliest good evidence we have that people were, were manipulating information in their minds in a symbolic manner, and therefore manipulating information in their minds the way we are, so what we do. So they were fully modern humans. You have to, first of all, the, 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 the hardware came on, came along, and then the software intruded to make us uh, fully human. And I, and I, I think we can, we can be fairly clear about that. We can never know what the images actually meant. We cannot ever know what the people who made this art were telling each other by making it. But we sure as hell know that the mental process that produced it is something that we are familiar with and that we can resonate to today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, going to our to the last part of our conversation now, uh, I would like to ask you, since we as Homo sapiens uh, throughout our history spread uh, over the globe, over practically the entire globe, uh, there were populations that were exposed to different selective pressures, to different climates, different environments, and there are, of course, some distinct characteristics that uh, we can use to distinguish one population from the other. Mm -hmm. So what I'm trying to ask you here is, do you think that in regards to that, we can talk about different human races. I mean, is that a, go a, a good scientific construct or not? No, I think it's not a good scientific construct because if you are going to, to create units, you have to have boundaries. Mm -hmm. And there are no boundaries. Homo sapiens is a very widespread species and it's quite likely that... Um, uh, many of the, the variations we see within the species were acquired in isolation from each other at various points over the, uh, over the, late, uh, over the late Pleistocene or even the, uh, the, the Holocene. Um, but we all remain members of the same species and we are all interbreeding. And interbreeding has been the signal throughout the, uh, the, uh, the history of, uh, of humankind. And we see signals in a genomic record of, uh, you know, catastrophic losses of genomes too. So, so some, some less pleasant things than, than, than interbreeding have uh, occurred as well. But it's all occurred within one species. And um, you, there's, there are, there, and, and so, so much so that all boundaries are blurred doesn't matter what, what, what feature you look at, uh, the boundaries, uh, are, are, it's not absolute. It's a continuum and um, there are no boundaries. So we don't have recognizable um, units that we can uh, regard as racist. We can look at somebody and say, oh, there's a good chance that that person had African antecedents or Australian antecedents or Eastern Asian. Um, antecedents, but then we'll find many, many cases where you can't say that, where you've got no idea. And um, if you don't, if, if, if you can't define your units in science, you can't do science with them. So from a scientific point of view, um, races um, uh, don't, don't exist. In fact, they become, they become a problem. Mm -hmm. Yes, I understand. But let me just ask you this, since there are still differences anatomical, morphological, physiological, and arguably 
psychological differences between different people with different ancestries that derive from populations that were exposed to different environments, different climates, and so slightly different selective pressures. Do you think that we can still distinguish them in any meaningful way, even if we use a term like, for example, population or not? Well, population is again a very uh, a very elusive term because uh, you have to to define uh, what your criteria are for recognizing populations. Um, this brings us back to the question of culture, and the basic thing about culture is that uh, you can take a child born anywhere in the world and take it anywhere else in the world, and it will grow up perfectly acculturated in the place in which it grew up. Right? So we are much more what we learn to be than we are what even our parents learn to be, let alone our great parents, uh, grandparents and great grandparents um, learn to be. We learn to be who we are and we are really who we think we are. And that is the most, that's the most important aspect of, uh, of our identities. Um, so yeah, we could have, have uh, you know, any, any number of uh, physical um, uh, you know, features and still have the same cultural identity. Mm -hmm. uh, and even in regards to cultures, I mean, many times it's difficult to uh, completely separate one culture from the other, particularly with the mobility that we have nowadays, because th th that's even talked uh, th that's even uh, a problem when it comes to cultural anthropology, for example, that is termed G Galton's problem, th that it was Sir Francis Galton that identified this problem of trying to distinguish between uh, strictly different cultures, right? Because there are influences that go back, in, back and forth between mm -hmm. different cultures. Oh yeah, no. A cultural uh, cultural identity is 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 very malleable, and uh, you know there are plenty. There are no pure cultures. You know, every culture is syncretic to uh, to, uh, to 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 some degree, and uh, so it's again on the cultural level. The same thing is basically happening as happens on the on the uh, the physical level. The odd thing, though, is that although we're all born capable of acquiring any culture, by the time we're 10, you know, we have acquired a worldview that may be very, very different from the worldview that a member of our very own species has acquired, um, has acquired somewhere else um, in the world, you know, and that is, that is, uh, you know, a, a basis for possible uh, misunderstanding and that has expressed itself. You know, as, as people from different learned cultures have come together more densely packed in more places in the world, we find more conflict um, uh, among them. And uh, that is our, uh, uh, rather than anything biological, is much more the problem that has to be faced. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let me just ask you one last question. We've already mentioned some of the limitations that we have uh, in paleoanthropology. I mean, for example, the fact that we really can't go back in a time machine and understand exactly the meaning behind a particular piece that is clearly symbolic, for example, and perhaps we have some missing links in our evolutionary tree that we have yet to discover. But uh, since you, you're also worried in your work about uh, narratives that people uh, have going on in paleoanthropology and other paleosciences. We've already mentioned race, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, would you like to mention other narratives that you think might be pernicious that are still uh, going around in the paleosciences? 
Yeah, well, the, 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 I think the most uh, uh, pernicious would be uh, the notion that we have been formed by natural selection to be who we are. I think this is very, very misleading. You know, and the, the, uh, the, there is a whole industry of evolutionary psychology that tries to explain uh, the way, the, the uh, mismatches, if you want, between uh, uh, behavior and good sense today um, in terms of what happened in the past. We're still prisoners of our, uh, of our uh, ancient uh, hunter and gatherer selves because we haven't had time to change into new urbanites, which is absolutely ridiculous. It's totally ridiculous because we've, we've created these changes ourselves and obviously we can adapt um, or accommodate intellectually to any, any set of circumstances. But the idea that, the, the, that when we do stupid things or inappropriate things, it's driven uh, by, our, by our past and, and by, by, by what we used to do to be, it's, a, it's, it's just a horrible excuse. We do have free will. And we have free will precisely because nature does not specify what kind of creature we are. And we have to understand that. And that we are responsible for what we do. Mm -hmm. But in terms of evolutionary psychology, don't you think that at least as humans, at the level of our brain and psychology that at least as a species we all share a basic set or underlying psychology. I mean, at least some cognitive mechanisms that we all possess. Or oh, that is a good point. And, and I think one very good thing that uh, the uh, evolutionary psychologists uh, uh, have done and are doing is actually documenting and uh, documenting with uh, quite some precision exactly how our humans behave around the world and exactly how cultural accommodations differ from one place to the next. And that is all very useful and, and interesting and, and valuable material. My only que question, my only quarrel is with attributing, uh, you know, anomalous behaviors to the past and making us not responsible for the ways in which we behave today. Mm -hmm. Okay, so just to make this clear, you think that evolutionary psychologists disregard a culture and probably uh, th things that people learn during their development too much and they think that uh, cognitive mechanisms that we evolved until I mean until we arrived at our current state play a bigger role than learning and culture in our behavior is that it oh, yeah, that's basically it yeah I mean they are very 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 conscious of culture and in the documentation of culture nobody's done uh, done, done better work but it is attributing aspects of culture Two aspects of the genome uh, that I think uh, the, uh, the, the misunderstanding takes place. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Dr. Tetterso, let's end on that note. And just before we go, uh, I will be leaving yeah. links to your work and to your books in the description box of the interview. But would you like, oh, to, mention, you. Would you like to mention some specific places on the internet where people can find your work if they're interested? Gosh, uh, on the internet, I have uh, I have a website, uh, but it's uh, it's not very assiduously uh, updated, I'm afraid. But it's uh, iantattersall.com, um, uh, and that has a list of most of my books. I would I'd rather rather point you to my printed stuff, really, than to my uh, to, to 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 the stuff on the internet, since I have very little control over what's out there uh, on, the, on the internet. But check out the last couple of books that I did with uh, Rob DeSalle on uh, uh, the accidental homo sapiens um, is, 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 is a nice one. I really like, uh, like uh, um, a very badly titled book called Masses of the Planet, um, which uh, I, I hate the triumphalist title, but I never want to battle over a title with an editor in, uh, in, in, in my life. 
So those books are out there and they're, they're easy to find. And uh, if you're interested in some in, in this area, worth looking for. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I will include all of that in the description box of the interview. And Dr. Tethersall, again, it was really an immense pleasure to have you on the show. I'm a really big fan of your work. And thank you again for taking the time to come on the show. Oh, you're very kind. It's been such fun and you're such a great uh, interviewer. Thank you. Okay. Hello everybody, thank you for watching this interview until the end. As you might have noticed, I've started this channel back in February 2018 and have been putting out regular interviews with academics and intellectuals from a variety of fields. And to keep the channel sustainable, I would like to ask you to please visit my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge there. And I also have links to PayPal in the description box of the interview. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my patrons and main supporters, Karin Litzke, and Blanchett, Peruga Larsen, Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Ricardo Vladimir, Craig Healy, Adam Castle, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, David Diaz, Anian Kata, Jacob Klimpi, Matthew Whittingbird, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollacy, Enrique Alenius, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Rutger Voss, Bo Weingart, Rebecca Newberger Goldstein, Dan Demetri, Robert Windegger, Rui Inácio, Arthur Coe, Marco Neves, Max Belby, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Thomas Trumbull, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurbano, Simon Columbus, Jorge Spigny, Phil Cavanagh, Corey Clark, Mark Blythe, Roberto Inguanzo, Mikkel Stormir, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andreev, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Hugney, Alexander Dunbauer, Omari Hickson, Felicia Stevens, Fergal Cusson, Evan Bodrenko, Hal Herzog, Nuno Machado, Don Ross, João Alves da Silva, Jonathan Labrant, Os Oslem Bullet, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, J.W., João Eira, Tom Hummel, Sardus France, David Sloan Wilson, and the Asila Deza Araujo, my producers, Isar Weber, Jim Frank, Lucas Tafiniak, Dr. Ian Gilligan, Sergio Quadriano, Luis Caetano, Matthew Lavender, Tom Van Egdam, Curtis Dixon, João Linhares, Benedict Mueller, Verge, Vega Gidi, and my executive producers, Michel Rogieski, Rosie, and James Pratt. Thank you for all.